Well, this is the Sabbath after we have kept very joyous and uh, blessed days of unleavened bread, I believe. Thankfully, brethren, we do understand God's word, we do understand God's plan. We have kept what God commanded, unlike the nominal Christianity, which last Sunday and last Friday uh, uh, kept the uh, Catholic and Protestant Easter. And uh, right now, this Friday, which was the last day of unleavened bread, this Saturday and this Sunday, the Eastern nominal Christians are keeping their Easter. So, uh, this is one of the most important messages, I think, that, or one of the most important messages that I've ever delivered to you, and I think it just uh, ties in very well and very appropriately with the holiday that we have just kept, in which we were reminded that we are to be feeding on the bread of life, which is Jesus Christ, that is His Word. So, the importance of Bible study. You see, while we were in this world, brethren, we were spiritually retarded. Let us turn to over to Romans chapter 10 and beginning in verse 1. Now, people in this world, they do not consider themselves spiritually retarded. They think that they know and understand the Bible and they consider themselves as a God-fearing people. Paul spoke of Israel of old and it applies to the East House of Israel today. Romans chapter 10 verse 1 and 2. Brethren, my heart's desire and prayer to God for Israel is that they may be saved. For I bear them witness that they have a zeal for God, but not according to knowledge. As we are going to see, brethren, the zeal of God is a uh, misguided zeal, the zeal of, for God which they had, which they used to have in the Old Testament, which they have today, modern Israelites in the New Testament. It's a misguided zeal. But they claim to be a God-fearing people. They claim to be religious. They claim to be Christian, but not according to knowledge. Not according to the to the truths of the God's word. Verse 3. For they, being ignorant of God's righteousness, which is found in the pages of the Bible, and seeking to establish their own righteousness, have not submitted to the righteousness of God. Religions of this world have been established to help men create for himself a spirit of self-righteousness. They have not submitted themselves to the righteousness of God. People in this world, brethren, would never think that they are spiritually retarded. Yet... That is what we are taught, because notice now Romans 11, verse 7. Romans 11, verse 7. What then? Israel has not obtained what it seeks, but the elect have obtained it, and the rest were blinded. What then? Because the house of Israel has gone about seeking God its own way, making God in their own image, Israel has not obtained that with what it asked for. But the election, that is us, brethren, have obtained it. Yet the rest were blinded, blinded spiritually. Verse 8, just as it is written, God has given them a spirit of stupor, eyes that they should not see, and ears that they should not hear, to this very day. The Bible says they're spiritually retarded. They can read the Bible, but they do not truly understand it. Verse 9, and David says, let their table become a snare and a trap, a stumbling block and a recompense to them. Now, why a table? Well, what do you put on a table? Food, of course. Let their spiritual diet become a snare, a trap, a stumbling block and a recompense to them. And what is their spiritual diet, brethren? The stuff that, they're, that is dished out to them every Sunday morning in the churches of this world. That is, what the people prefer to hear rather than the truth of the Bible that commands them to change their way of life, to give up Sunday for Saturday, to give up Christmas and Easter for the holidays of God, to start tithing, to obey the laws of unclean and clean meats, those kinds of things they don't want to hear. They would prefer to soothe the soothsayers and the platitudes of Sunday morning sermons. And so David says, let their spiritual diet become a snare to them. Their diet is twisting the Bible because they do not want to obey it, brethren. And yet, they do want a pretense of righteousness so they can feel good about themselves. But by going in this direction, they're permitting themselves to be spiritually retarded. Now, we were in exactly the same situation. But then one day, God came along and called us and gave us His Holy Spirit, whereby we had come out of spiritual retardation and more and more we have come to the point that we know 
things that the most brilliant minds in this world do not comprehend. God's Spirit is in our control once it is given to us. It does not possess any of you. It does not force us to do anything. Our free moral agency remains with us. Now let us turn over to Psalm 119, verse 99. Psalm 119, verse 99. David says, I have more understanding than all my teachers, for your testimonies are my meditation. In this world, we are spiritually retarded, brethren, but now the time has come through the Spirit of God that we have an understanding that has denied the great brains of this world. I have more understanding than all my teachers, for your testimonies are my meditation. Look at the next verse 100. I understand more than the ancients because I keep your precepts. Now, why is it that a person who is spiritually retarded in this world with the gift of God's Spirit can come to the point where they are ahead of the rest of humankind? Well, again, verse 99, the second part, for your testimonies are my meditation. In other words, the Word of God has seeved into the mind of this individual because he has studied the, his Bible and is continuing to do so. Not only studying the Bible, but the latter part of verse 100, because I keep your precepts. You see, he studies the Bible to obey the Bible, and in consequence, an individual that was once spiritually retarded becomes spiritually brilliant compared to people in this world. Now, prayer and obedience go hand in hand. We notice that the framework of prayer of Jesus in Matthew 6 was based upon the Ten Commandments of the Old Testament in sequential order and with surrounding principles involving the observance of all those Ten Commandments. When we pray the framework prayer, we are praying the law of God and in consequence a way of life. And so if we study the Bible, we are studying the law of God and we are in consequence studying a way of life. It is for those reasons that prayer and Bible study must go hand in hand, brethren. You cannot have one without the other. Look at verse 97. Oh, how I love your law. Isn't that one of the hymns we sing? Oh, how I love your law. It is my meditation all the day. I daily study your word. In consequence, because I study it and obey it, you, through your commandments, have made me wiser than my enemies. Verse 98. For they, your commandments, are ever with me. Because daily I study a word that contains those commandments. We are a very chosen, a very special people, brethren. Not through any goodness in ourselves. We have been given the Spirit of God whereby we comprehend and understand things that are denied to this world. In the framework prayer, that are several, there are several divisions that were given to it. We pray those particular subjects, but if we pray them alone, without studying, it becomes null and void. Because the subjects are contained throughout the entirety of the Bible, not just in the framework prayer that Jesus gave us in Matthew 6. Now any person that tries to pray this prayer without studying the Word of God, that prayer in a long run is going to be ineffective. Now of those seven subjects contained in the Lord's Prayer, as they call it, the first one is God's character, our Father who is in heaven. But how do we learn of God's character, brethren? Well, of course, by studying the Bible. The second subject is God's kingdom, thy kingdom come. But how do we find out what that kingdom is going to be like? Well, by studying the prophecies contained in the Bible. The third subject is God's will, thy will be done as you know in, on the earth as it is in heaven. Now, how can we know God's will unless we study the Bible that tells us His will? And then comes our needs, our daily bread. Give us our daily bread every day. So... Uh, how can we know what is really important in the needs of our lives unless the Bible tells us what is? How about sins? Forgive us our sins. Forgive us our trespasses. Well, how can we understand repentance, true repentance that brings to conversion without the study of God's word? How about trials? How can we learn to cope with trials and persevere and endure without the example of others before us, the patriarchs and other great men of God? How can we come to a comprehension of God's greatness without the study, once again, of His Word? Likewise, with the principles that we have been given, brethren, to know how to praise God. We cannot praise Him with pagan stuff and pagan customs, you know, as many people think. No, 
In order to know how to praise God, again, that comes through His Word. Vision is given to us by the study of the Bible. Remember that without prophetic vision, people perish, says the prophet Isaiah. Now, what is true submission? What is true reliance and dependence upon God? How do we overcome? All these things are taught to us in the Bible. Therefore, to pray more effectively on these principles, on those subjects, Bible study must go hand in hand with prayer. What we are told here in Psalm 119 is that the day comes for us also when we have more understanding than our teachers. And we understand more than the ancients. The Bible is written in a simple language. But people read the exact same words that we read and they do not get the true understanding. That is why the Bible is uh, Bible is, is, is secret, is under, not understandable. It's, it's kind of closed to the understanding of this, uh, of this world. They can, you know, people in the world, they can read the words. They can understand the language. But God blinded their minds to what the book really means. Psalm 119 verse 10. You see, brethren, this word does not want, this world, uh, this word is here for us, of course, and it's in, in simple language, but this world does not want to obey God. It wants a false gospel to listen to. That is their spiritual diet, their table that becomes a snare to them because they don't want to obey, to obey God, yet they want a pretense of righteousness. Psalm 111 verse 10. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. A good understanding have all those who do His commandments. His praise endures forever. God must be obeyed, brethren. But to understand what those commandments are, you need to study the Bible. And the more we study, and the more we obey, the greater becomes our understanding and our spiritual intellect. Not to strive for personal vanity, but for the greater service to God and of his work, and of our fellow men. You see, a good understanding of the Bible have all they that keep and do his commandments. So when we pray, that framework of prayer, we are praying what we are praying, you know, uh, we are praying for a way of life. When we study the Bible, we are studying a way of life. You see, the two must go hand in hand. Now in Matthew 6, Jesus spoke about our personal needs. In the parallel account of Luke 11, we see that after Jesus has given the framework of prayer at that particular occasion, he went on to elaborate about our daily bread. He showed that the most important thing that we should be praying for is not just a physical sustenance, but spiritual nourishment. Because he likened our daily bread to the Holy Spirit that God would give to us on a daily basis if we are praying and studying. It has to be on a daily basis because as it comes into us through contact with God, it has to flow out of us again in good works. So it has to be renewed. Now we see at that time how Jesus in that case, when our daily bread is concerned, emphasized the fact of the Holy Spirit. But the daily bread means something else besides the Holy Spirit and it is found in Matthew 4 and beginning in verse 3. Matthew 4. Uh, beginning in verse 3. Now, when the temper came to him, tempter came to him, he said, If you are the Son of God, command that these stones become bread. <laughs> the old tempter, just like the one who came to Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden. You know, if, if, you know, uh, did God, you know, putting a doubt, did God say, well, if, you see, if you are the Son of God, we meaning, prove it to me. Well, now Jesus was used to praying to God for his daily bread, brethren. He certainly had the power as the Son of God in Satan's sight to change stones to bread, which he was in dire need of in one sense because of the uh, 40 days of fasting indeed. And then we read in verse 4, But he answered and said, It is written, so he was the word of God, he knew perfectly what is written. It is written, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. Well, where are the words, brethren, that have proceeded from the mouth of God? They are in your Bible. In other words, not only is the Holy Spirit likened to daily bread, spiritual nourishment that we need, but the Bible itself is also likened to daily bread. Daily, 
we need to study it every day of our lives that we can learn how to better live by God's command and what He desires of us. So, these are the words that have proceeded from the mouth of God, written and recorded for our benefit. God nourishes us, brethren, in the womb of the church, the mother of all, as uh, the Apostle Paul calls the, the, the church as the spiritual mother of all in Galatians. But we have to go to the refrigerator or to the kitchen shelf, if you wish, to get the food. The refrigerator or the kitchen shelf does not come to us and dump its content over us. We have to go to the book. In other words, as we have to make ourselves go on our knees every day, so we should make ourselves study our Bibles. And in reality, it should not be making of ourselves the desire, the want ought to be there. While we are on the subject of bread, let us turn over to John chapter 6 and beginning in verse 26. There is a question that only each one of us can answer individually to ourselves. The question is, how do you rate the Bible in importance in your life? Now, most people in this world, when they pray the Lord's Prayer and give us our daily bread, only think in terms of physical. And true, we should be praying for physical sustenance indeed. We should be praying for health from God because through food comes the health as well. And those are the great blessings. But Jesus Christ has shown us there are two things more important than just physical bread. First thing is God's Spirit. And the second thing is study of God's Word. Now, people in this world, if they have food, if they have bread available, they will rarely let themselves starve to death. Well, true, there are individuals who, on occasion, go on a hunger strike just to make a point, and uh, then they go back to eating again. But none of us here is on a hunger strike, physically speaking. But, brethren, how many of us may be on a hunger strike, or malnourished, spiritually speaking, and... Uh, are there even some who may be even more than malnourished? Are there any of us who are spiritually starving themselves to death? John 6, 26. Jesus answered them and said, Most assuredly I say to you, you seek me, not because you saw the signs, but because you ate of the loaves and were filled. Now, we would think that all reasons that the people followed Jesus Christ, surely it was because of the miracles he had done. And they would want to see more miracles. Well, no. It was a much more mundane reason that they followed Jesus Christ. We have just quoted his words after a miracle feeding of the 5,000. Verse 27. Do not labor for the food which perishes, but for the food which endures to everlasting life, which the Son of Man will give you because God the Father has set his seal on him. You see, something far more important than our daily bread. It is a meal when we are fed by God himself, the spiritual food that can sustain us to eternity. Yet these people wanted physical food more than the spiritual, even more than seeing a miracle. Now physical food is tremendously important to us, isn't it? But brethren, we have to have the mind of God and see that this bread, the Bible is more important than our daily physical food. Job 23 and verse 12. How important is the Bible to us? How important the Bible is to us, I wonder. How do we rate it in importance in our lives? You see, if we are starving ourselves spiritually to death, we are in a very dangerous situation. You know, physical food will not get us into the kingdom of God. It is enjoyable, as God intended it to be, we should be grateful to God for it, but if we let go of what is really important, you know, some people find the Bible dull. They find the dessert very interesting. But desserts only last so long. This book, properly studied, can become far more interesting than any fancy meal that anybody can cook in this world. Job 23, verse 12. I have not departed from the commandments of his lips. I have treasured the words of his mouth more than my necessary food. He's not talking about dessert, brethren. Dessert was unnecessary. I've treasured the words of his mouth, the Bible, more than my necessary food. That is what Job had to say. Let's now take a look at what David had to say in Psalm 119. Now this Psalm 119 is the longest chapter in the entire Bible, and it is not just a psalm about the greatness of God's law. It is also a psalm about the greatness of God's word 
that delineates the law. It is the Bible study chapter of the Bible. So it's not just a law chapter. Psalm 119 verse 103. How sweet are your words to my taste, sweeter than honey to my mouth. There are times when we feel all it is a grind to study the Bible. You know, we would rather, much rather eat physical dessert than trying to find enjoyment out of the book. But notice also the attitude of David when Bible study is concerned in verse 162. I rejoice at your word as one who finds great treasure. The Bible was a treasure to David. People in this world get fantastically excited if they win a lotto. But David had the right perspective on human life here on this earth. He knew what was the true, the real treasure, what really counted. Because we are going to be so rich, brethren, in the world to come. We are going to own the universe. But in order to get there and possess it, we have to have our priorities right and straight. This book is worth more than any daily food, more than our daily food. This book is worth more than any great treasure you can find on this earth. Notice what Jeremiah had to say in his regard to Bible study, Jeremiah 15 verse 16. In Lord's Prayer, Jesus tells us what to pray about. But indeed, there is no similar instruction by which he tells us what to study. And the reason why is clear. Those subjects, those principles and those Themes given to us in the framework prayer are the subjects and principles elaborated in the pages of the Bible. We have the book. There are many subjects within it. We have prophecy, we have principles of living, wisdom, historical examples of mistakes that people made or good works they performed, examples that we should or we could follow or turn our back on. All of those things are there. Now what method do you choose to study the Bible? God leaves it up to your personal preference. The important thing is that we do study the book. And the more and more we know from beginning to end, he allows you to choose the subjects that you prefer. Now some people, they, you know, like to read the Bible from Genesis to Revelation. Others would prefer to do it one book here, one book there. God respects our individual personalities in that regard. What counts to him is that we have our noses in the book on a daily basis and as we are going to see that we do it in hand with God. Jeremiah fifteen sixteen. You probably thought I forgot to quote that, but no I haven't. <laughs> Jeremiah fifteen sixteen. Again, this is one I think one of the most important messages I have to give you, brethren. And uh, I was very happy and very eager to deliver it to you because it just uh, ties in so perfectly well as far as I can see perfectly well with the wonderful holiday we've just kept with the Days of Unleavened Bread. Jeremiah fifteen sixteen, Your words were found, and I ate them, and your word was to me the joy and rejoicing of my heart. For I am called by your name, O Lord God of hosts. Jeremiah ate those words. Uh, in Serbian translation rendering it says, he, I was eagerly uh, swallowing your words. So he ate those words, you know, energetically, enthusiastically, because the Bible is spiritual bread. Like Jeremiah, every one of us here is called by God's name. Therefore, we must be studying his word and his book on a daily basis. Now, how great is the Bible in your eyes? Is it worth more than our daily food? Is it to you some great treasure that you might find on this earth? Well, Bible is even more than that, brethren. Psalm 19 this is a psalm extolling the word of God. The first half of that Psalm 19, it deals with the glory of God's universe. The heavens declare the glory of God. Yes, we have the hymn exactly that we sing. Psalm 19, 1, the heavens declare the glory of God and the firmament shows his handiwork. Now David goes on to show how the heavens teach us about God. How a gospel is preached in a sense by what we see in outer space. But all that we see out there brethren. Is inferior to the book. Because in verse 7. Having used the universe as a stepping stone. David steps upward to something that is of a far greater. All greater than all of the constellations and galaxies put together. Well why is that brethren? Well because this book is the mind of God. 
And the mind of God cannot be compared to anything that has been created physically. True, the physical extols the glory of God, but the mind of God is right here in the book. His character is to abide in us by daily study of His word. Verse 7, The law of the Lord is perfect, converting the soul. The testimonies of the Lord are sure, making wise the simple. The testimony of God, brethren, Bible, is sure, making wise the simple. You and I were spiritually retarded in this world. Now we have a wisdom that excels the wisdom of all the ancients. People in this world look up to Plato and Aristotle and other ancient philosophers. Well, not so in the world to come, not so in their resurrection. There will be nobodies in that time. And the truly wise are us here. Not for any goodness on our own, but because of what God has done to our minds. Verse 8. The statutes of the Lord are right, rejoicing the heart. The commandments of the Lord are pure, enlightening the eyes. A good understanding have those that keep God's commandments. Our minds have been enlightened, brethren, and we are no longer spiritually retarded. Now, none of the glories of the physical universe can begin to compare to the glory of the book that we hold in our hands. Because none of the glories of the physical universe can compare to the mind of God who made them. And the God who resides in the third heaven has put his mind in this book and then made this book our possession. And more than that, he's giving us of his spirit so that unlike the people in the world, we can understand and we can comprehend. We can understand what is said here. You know, the people in the world, they can read the same words and not comprehend. Because we have the Spirit of God, these words that we read become alive to us and teach us things that are hidden from the rest of humankind. As we have to pray daily for more of the Holy Spirit, as Jesus showed us in Luke 11, so also we have to pray for a deeper understanding of God's, God's Bible as we study it. You know, for greater wisdom to be drawn from it. A knowledge that becomes more and more complete of what God teaches and what God says. Notice Jeremiah chapter 33 and verse 3. Jeremiah chapter 33 verse 3. Call to me and I'll answer you and show you great and mighty things which you do not know. Call to me. And I'll answer you and show you great and mighty things which you do not know. Interesting, isn't it? What we study before God, well, brethren, God allows us to choose. We can choose this, that, or the other topic. As I said, we can have different methods of uh, studying the Bible, but that's okay. It's, uh, God is happy with all of that. He created us as individuals, and that's okay. The method that we choose for ourselves, you know, to better understand and enhance our understanding and comprehension and our obedience to God's word. Now, whether we start from Genesis to Revelation, whether you choose to do individual books, whether you choose to use the materials we covered to help you in, our, in your study, that's fine. Whatever you choose, God expects you to do it hand in hand with Him. You see, the Bible is the one book in the world. As we read it over again and over again, we always get the deeper understanding and a new meaning from it if we have the Spirit of God. Let's turn back to Psalm 119. So prayer should be on our knees, whether after we study at our desk, but it must begin with God, certainly, that we ask God for His inspiration and His help, that He would teach us uh, great and mighty things that we know not. That, you know, we, we, we do pray that he would uh, also help us better understand and appreciate his word, his mind, his character. Psalm 119 verse 11. Again, the prayer for Bible study, this time by David. Open my eyes that I may see wondrous things from your law. And Bible, Bible study done correctly can be a very exciting part of our days. Asking God for help, for His help to better understand, you would be amazed at some of the things you begin to see in the Bible. You read it before, and yet the understanding is deeper. And then you say, well, why didn't I see that before? Well, you see, you read the words, 
But now you have a greater understanding of what they mean and how to and how they apply. And as I have already emphasized, it must be done on a daily basis. Deuteronomy 17 and beginning in verse 18. The laws of the kings of Israel and the kings of Judah. And we are studying to become far greater kings, brethren, than any of the kings that have ever sat on any physical throne. Very soon, the longest ruling monarch in Britain, Queen Elizabeth II, she would celebrate the 70 years of being on the throne of David. How exciting and great. But dear, nevertheless, brethren, we are going to be far greater kings with far greater responsibilities in the world to come. So we are Deuteronomy 17, verse 18. And it shall be, when he sits on the throne of his kingdom, that he shall write for himself a copy of this law in a book from the one before the priests, the Levites. So what part of the Bible was extant at that time? Well, the king was told by God to write it out word for word. Now, we are not obliged to do that today, but the principle still applies. The whole thrust of this scripture is that he was to truly understand what was written and contained in the law of God. Verse 19. And it shall be with him, and he shall read it all the days of his life, that he may learn to fear the Lord his God, and be careful to observe all the words of this law and these statutes. It, the Bible, shall be with him, and he shall read it all the days of his life. You see, better it must be daily. As it says in Psalm 1, I'll just remind you what it says in Psalm 1. It says, Blessed the man who walks not in the counsel of ungodly, nor stands in the path of sinners, nor sits in the seat of the scornful. But his delight is in the law of the Lord, and in his law he meditates day and night. You see, his delight is not in the television, you know, we can read in the same words that other nominal Christians are reading, and you can understand in, in the right way, and they, you know, they cannot. This special understanding is something that God reserved for us, and it must be appreciated. Colossians chapter 2 and verse, beginning in verse 1. Yet there might be those that don't appreciate it. They neglect Bible study even so often, you know, there are days when they are spiritually malnourished, and uh, if they keep it up long enough, they will starve to death. Colossians 2 verse 1. For I want you to know what a great conflict I have for you, and for those in Laodicea, and for as many as have not seen my face in my flesh. The Laodiceans, of course, as we learn from Revelation, they were a group that were condemned for their spiritual lethargy. They were in the church, they were warming a seat, they prayed and studied every so often, but it was like a, like a dicycle stuff, brethren. Like a dicycle stuff because it wasn't sufficient to marry them safety from the coming great tribulation. The word of God is not truly their delight. You know, they're one foot in the world and the other foot in the church. But I've given, but you know, I have a great conflict in my heart, Paul says. Verse 2, that their hearts may be encouraged, being knit together in love, and attaining to all riches of the full assurance of understanding, to the knowledge of the mystery of God, both of the Father and of Christ. You see, understanding, knowledge, and wisdom. Now, what is understanding? Well, verse 3. In whom are hidden all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. So, brethren, understanding is in verse 2. Wisdom and knowledge are in verse 3. And God, all these treasures... The things of real value, where it eternity is, where, where eternity is concerned, you know, the things of all the values, it, God keeps them hidden from the rest of the world. Now, some people step into God's church, and they put, they, they never really discover what they stumbled upon, because they never really set themselves to draw close to God through those two keys: prayer and Bible study. They take it in a lackadaisical attitude. And they learn some things, yes, because they hear what is preached, but do they really, you know, do they really make it count? 
Now these treasures are hidden from the rest of the world. Remember what David said in one of the Psalms. He said, I rejoice at your word as one who finds great treasure. And this is the treasure. The book that each of us owns, that book, you know, that God has given us into our possession. Psalm 25, beginning in verse 12. Psalm 25, verse 12. Who is the man that fears the Lord? Him shall he teach in the way of in the way he chooses. Now, you know, you can pray to God to direct your Bible study, and particularly which book you would like to study at a particular time. You can say to God, Well, Father, I'm new in your church. I would like to read it from the beginning to end to start off with. And then, you know, you can study the books in greater depth. Well, God will respect that. But the day comes when you don't know what book to study, and you ask God. And God will teach you in a way that he would choose that he would choose for you because he knows which book is best for you at any particular time of your individual spiritual development. Verse 13, he himself shall dwell in prosperity and his descendants shall inherit the earth. But notice verse 14, the secret of the Lord is with those who fear him and he will show them his covenant. Well, it is a secret, brethren. It's hidden from the rest of the world. What a fantastic treasure. A book that is greater in value than all the universe because it contains the mind of God. The God who made the universe. His secret is with those who fear him. And that means obeying what they study. And he will show them his covenant. Well, we understand the plan of salvation, brethren, which this world does not. Because we keep the holidays of God, which this world does not. We keep the holidays that teach that plan of salvation. But sometimes, brethren, we do not realize what a fantastic privilege it is. It's not just to own the Bible, but to understand what it says. And there are those who despise the privilege of what is offered to them because they allow themselves to become spiritually malnourished. Sometimes they go out of the church, starving themselves to death. Now what happens to people who spiritually starve themselves to death in God's church? Well, when they go back to the world and they become spiritually retarded once again. You see, it is in Psalm 111. A good understanding have all those who keep His commandments. Not just study them, but keep what they study. If you stop keeping what you have studied, then the understanding gradually over a period of time is lost. We have seen an example of that, brethren, even just prior to this year's Feast of Unleavened Bread here in Serbia. I'm sure you have seen, some of you have seen it elsewhere. So, how much understanding is lost? It is amazing. I can, you know, give you examples from my wider family and uh, various other friends who were with me once upon a time in the church. To one of my relatives I sent uh, some, some text about Constantine the Great and uh, asked her if there was any there was any correction she could make in uh, she could make in the English text, and uh, she uh, the feedback from her was <laughs> quite honest and uh, very sincere. She said, "Oh, I'm so impressed how you have remembered all of these things. I've forgotten them all." And that is a person through whom I was called into God's church. Uh, she came in touch with the church seven years before I did. She was a great example of a Christ-like living, and that is what drew me to the Bible. And some things that she said to me at that time was that the uh, Europe is going to be united and it will be led by Germany and uh, glued together by the Catholic religion and that the Vatican and Germany were going to be uh, basically uniting Europe. And I could see that at that time that would be the 90s because my my country, country which I, in, in which I was born, former Yugoslavia, uh, was being completely torn apart by the efforts of Germany and Vatican. So I realized that what she was saying was true. But brethren, I've forgo- I have not, not forgotten those things. And over the time, I've been, you know, by reading the Bible for the first time in my life, in that will be in 19, the end of 1991, by the, that time my, my knowledge has increased and my appreciation for God's Word has increased and uh, my loyalty was tested soon after in 1995 when the great... 
apostasy came. But, you know, it, it just amazes me. Amazes me how quickly a good understanding stops and gradually over a period of time gets lost with those who stopped keeping what they had studied. You see, a good understanding we will have if we continue to keep the commandments. But if we stop, the special understanding that God has given to us will gradually disappear or be perverted by Satan's mind. When Jesus Christ tells us to pray for our daily bread, he is referring to more than just physical food. In fact, Jesus had three things in mind, brethren, and with these three things we are going to conclude this message. The first thing was that the spiritual bread can represent the Holy Spirit, spiritual nourishment that we need on a daily basis in order to truly effectively obey God. Keep in mind, it says, Jesus Christ said to the woman at the well, that his believers will serve him and serve God the Father in the truth and spirit. You can never spiritually really observe the law or keep the law as we should, as you should unless you have God's spirit. Yes, you can understand it on the academic level, but in order to really be pleasing to God, each one of us must serve him in, 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 in truth and in spirit. So that was the first one. The Bible is likened to bread also because it teaches us the mind of God which also we need to eat of daily to begin to think and act like God. There is the third meaning to spiritual bread in the Bible, John chapter 6 and beginning in verse 35. You see, the Lord's Prayer, when we analyze it, it has seven subjects in it, so it is perfect. But there is something missing. So it is perfect and yet not complete. The prayer that begins with the name of the Father must end with the name of the Son. Jesus taught us that we pray the prayer in His name so that we give honor to the Father, but we also give honor to the Son. And we conclude in the name of the Son to bring home to mind to us that when we get up from our knees and strive to go through this day in Satan's world, we have to live it as Jesus Christ, be we male or female. As He lived His life in Satan's world, so we have to seek to duplicate it. So we end the prayer in Christ's name, not just because it is on His authority we are able to go before the Father in the third heaven in vision, but also that we might live as Jesus Christ lived. And so the third meaning of spiritual bread in the Bible, John 6.35. And Jesus said to them, I am the bread of life. He who comes to me shall never hunger, and he who believes in me shall never thirst. Verse 48. I am the bread of life. Your fathers ate the manna in the wilderness and are dead. You see, brethren, the physical bread they ate, you know, it was nice while they ate it, of course, but where are they now? They're all dead. Now, this is the bread, on the other hand, Jesus Christ, verse 50, which comes down from heaven that one may eat of it and not die. Those fathers might have eaten, you know, might, might have eaten of, of, of the special Miraculous bread indeed, uh, and that bread certainly came down from heaven. Yes, he's speaking about manna. So, uh, there are various commentaries what manna looked like. But in any case, you know, it was a miraculous bread that came down from heaven to them, but that bread didn't qualify them for salvation. Brethren, no physical food can do that. No physical food can qualify us for salvation, even if it does come down from heaven. Only the spiritual bread, Jesus Christ, can qualify us for eternity. I'm the living bread which came down from heaven. So I'm spiritual bread, he said, not physical. Verse 51. I'm the living bread which came down from heaven. So spiritual bread, not physical again. If anyone eats of this bread, he will live forever. And the bread that I shall give is my flesh, which I shall give for the life of the world. So, brethren, what we see is this. We see that there are three kinds of spiritual bread. The Holy Spirit, the Bible, and Jesus Christ. And all those three are tied in, integrally tied in together. You have to live the life of Jesus Christ. 
But how do you find out how to live it? Well, by reading the Bible that talks about the life of Jesus Christ. And not just his physical life on this earth, but the Bible reveals his entire mentality. It teaches us, also teaches us all, of his character in the pages of this book. And at the same time, you need the gift of the Holy Spirit to effect the living of Jesus Christ in our own daily lives. Verse 38. For I have come down from heaven, not to do my own will, but the will of him who sent me. Now what is the will of the Father who sent him? Verse 39. This is the will of the Father who has sent me, that all of all he has given me, I should lose nothing, but should raise it up at the last day. If we stop studying the mind of Jesus Christ, Christ will lose us eventually, brethren. That is not God's will, but that happens. We must daily take hold of Jesus Christ, and when we take hold of the Bible, we are you know, taking hold on Him, on His mind. And to emphasize it, verse 40, And this is the will of Him who sent me, that everyone who sees the Son and believes in Him may have everlasting life, and I'll raise Him up at the last day. When we get down on our knees, brethren, no matter what position we are in, this world, no matter where we, where we are coming from, you know, where we might be on the face of this earth, when we get down on our knees, God the Father sees us in vision before His throne in the third heaven. God sees us. But what happens when we study the Bible? Well, we see God. You see, we see His mind and we see His character. It is a special double privilege that has been given to us. And because of Jesus Christ, when we get down on our knees, God the Father sees us in vision before His throne in the third heaven. And we likewise can see God. But we see Him right here. We see Him in the Bible. As Jesus said in verse 40, that is, this is the will of Him who sent me, that everyone who sees the Son and believes in Him may have everlasting life. And I'll raise Him up at the last day. Now, none of us has seen Jesus Christ literally. How then are we going to be raised up at the last day if we haven't seen him? Well, brethren, because we have seen him. When we read the book, we are looking at God, his mind, his character. And we learn about the mind of God and we incorporate his thoughts into our mentality and into our thinking. So why should we pray? Well, not because we have got to, you know, not with that attitude but because we want to show love to God. Why should we study? Not once again because we have got to, you know. Oh, I've got to study. I've got to get in a half hour of study, but, you know. No, that, that's the wrong attitude. No, but because we want to study because I want to see God. I want to see His mind, and I want to see the glories of His fantastic character.